cut back to the close-up. He is the Sultan of Saturday mornings, the master of mass make-believe. We are in his hands. At 75, Joe Barbera presides over the General Motors of the cartoon industry, the Hanna-Barbera Studios, which have churned out more than 250 TV series, seen by more than half a billion people. How crude. You want to hear the noises and sound effects when we're talking. You stand around, you go, well, you can't, you know, that's the way the guy comes in. You go, well, but he's got to be little. His feet have got to go like that. But if he's big, tunka, 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 and do that. I said, look at the guy is, is lumbering. So write it down that way. This is the go, boom, boom, ga, doom, ba, doom. Like, and once in a while, we all look up and say, I wonder if anybody's watching this meeting here, <laughs> you know? Sorry, boss. It's not easy moving a boulder. <laughs> Go back one more time. Uh, uh, Stanley, get more pissed at him. Really let him have it here, would you please? Can the excuses. Some people outgrow cartoons and become bankers. <laughs> Joe Barbera outgrew banking and turned to cartoons more than half a century ago. Yeah! Actually, I was a tax man, an assistant income tax man. And here, a person that cannot add. I add with my fingers under the table. And suddenly I'm doing income tax returns. But while I was doing that, I used to draw. I used to draw cartoons and submit them to magazines and get them rejected regularly, every week. And then one day we sold one. I sold a cartoon. It was unbelievable. And I sold another one. Then I sold four of them. Then I got fired. <laughs> Barbera faked his way into a job with MGM, which in the 30s and 40s produced theatrical cartoons to run with its movies. He was teamed with another artist named Bill Hanna, his partner to this day, to create a single six-minute animated short. The result was another partnership. Never picked on the cat. He was an innocent little guy against the big bully. And we used to preview these things. You never heard laughs like this in a theater. I mean, screaming laughs. But no matter what, Tom did to Jerry, or Jerry did to Tom. They always survived it. Oh, yes. His, his fur grew back. And become great friends at the end. One time, they brought in a robot cat. <laughs> I mean, and uh, they put him again. He was so good that Jerry didn't stand a chance. So he had to go outside and recruit Tom to come back and get rid of this robot cat. For more than 20 years, Hannah and Barbera turned out Tom and Jerry's, winning seven Academy Awards and a place in Hollywood history when they brilliantly paired Jerry with Gene Kelly in Anchors Away. Ow. But in 1957, at the top of their craft, Hannah and Barbera were fired and the cartoon studio shut down. MGM kept the Oscars and the money, and the cat and the mouse. It was a shock, because Joe and I felt that we would be doing Tom and Jerry at MGM, I guess, forever, and probably retire on our pensions. Tom and Jerry uh, is still running strong. Everywhere. And I think MGM made $25 million in one year alone out of Well, I Tom heard and Jerry. syndication, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you get any of that? Oh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. no. Oh, if we were getting any percentage of Tom and Jerry, we'd be sitting in Monte Carlo right now doing this. You know? Television was making its first inroads on the motion picture theaters, and uh, they just decided who needs any more Tom and Jerry's. But television turned out to be a blessing in disguise. Barbera and Hannah put up $4,000 to produce a five-minute cartoon for the new TV market. But with such a slim budget, there was no way they could create animation as good as the old theatricals. So they decided that going cut rate was better than no rate at all. We were able to do a five-minute cartoon with 1,200 drawings instead of 26,000 drawings. But that was by necessity. That's to stay alive. And, you know, it didn't make that much difference. 
The process was called limited animation, and their first product, Huckleberry Hound, was an instant success. All righty, you smart aleck. I'm bulletproof now, so you better give up. Put up your dukes. Oh, no half dukes. So sorry. And that was followed in quick succession by Yogi Bear. And the Flintstones, the first primetime cartoon series on network television, still running in more than 80 countries around the world. That $4,000 investment ballooned into the largest animation factory in the world with Barbera personally presenting each new character for the ad agencies and the networks. I would cover the wall with storyboard sketches, each about that big. And on each one was a sketch of the story as it went along. And I had two of them, so I had four walls papered with these things. I'd say, well, Fred does this and that, and over here, he's in a helicopter. Then he comes along, and they skid around. And there's a big crash, and then he says, Fred! And he says, well, well yeah, Wilma. And I go through that whole thing like that. That would take one hour and a half for two stories, the whole pitch. And I remember doing five of them in one day. Five. One scream, and every, every troll in town heads for the door, you know what I mean? I mean Barbera is still pitching, the but the times, the tastes, and the sensibilities have changed. Why should the female scream? She just stopped screaming. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't scream. Why did you feel the need to have a host? I think we felt the need for an adult figure. Well, he, I mean, it is a school. Well, the host okay. controls. So this you is the really call, Why do you call him a host? The people who pick children's programs for the networks, like NBC's Phyllis Tucker Vincent and her aides, insist that Barbera stick to their rules. No racial or sexual stereotypes. Few words of more than one syllable, and above all, easy with the violence. What was once considered slapstick is now considered antisocial. I have one comment about your military school guys. No minority kids. Oh. That's the other thing you could even think about. Why? In today's military school, there's girls. You are right, you are right. Good heavens. This all results in, in a kind of a policing, which is necessary, and results in a kind of a leveling off of the, of the kind of entertainment. It's all the same, it seems to me. Homogenized. The, yeah. The, the, the way they rationalize, they say, anything that can be imitated by a child, we don't want to see. Therefore, you don't even throw pies in anybody's faces anymore. But, you know, I'll never forget going to one of the one of the pressure committees and saying, they, and I said, well, you know, I was raised on this kind of stuff. I was raised on this comedy, and it never hurt me. And they said, oh, yes, but look at the world today, they said. We've been sanitizing our stuff for years, but I don't see the world getting any better. I mean, I don't see, a, I don't see the children getting clean, sanitized in any way. Children do what they want, but it isn't the cartoons that do it. What I hate to see is that I can't make them laugh the way I used to make them laugh. It's dealing with the uh, merchandising companies is becoming more difficult. See, there's, a, there's something that happens to people. Uh, they come into the studio, they have never worked in the animation business before, they never created anything, but some kind of a miracle happens. Within two weeks, they're total authorities. I mean, they can draw, they can pick voices, they can direct the stuff, and what are you gonna do? That's the business, right? Do you fight them or do you roll with those punches? You learn to roll. That's what you call surviving. The business is not creative anymore. It's uh, manipulative. It's uh, leverage buyouts. It's mergers. It's, uh, and in the middle of it, somewhere are creative people trying to make it go. Who thought of that? You I did. think you did. Thank you, yeah. thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Some of Barbera's creative people are young enough to be his grandchildren but they're cartoon junkies who treat the boss with a mixture of deference and derision and who describe themselves as a collection of creative uh, weirdos. 
asking you this. <laughs> okay, you're, you're said it. Uh, Do you ever feel, uh, what am I doing? Uh, I, I'm, yes. I'm plotting the life of a, Is there someone who never existed. It was a piece of celluloid somewhere. No, I think, what am I doing when I go home? What am I doing? Why am I not writing a cartoon? <laughs> it's hard to say. Why am I it's, fixing it's dinner? Hard, what a waste of time. It's hard to be real mature. It's the silliest way to make a living, I think. <laughs> the absolute silliest way. But we love this it. Is, we love this it. This is silly? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. This is the real world. <laughs> yes. You didn't know that. True. <laughs> True. Barbera occasionally retreats from the real world to his Palm Springs Palazzo, one of his several homes. He bought it after he and Bill Hanna sold the studio to the Taft Broadcasting Company back in 1965 for about $12 million, or about $90 million less than it may be worth today. He now works for the company he started. What made you sell out for only, what, $12.5 million? Yeah. I don't know. Greed, I guess. <laughs> I mean, who ever heard of that much money, even in those days? But I cannot look back. <laughs> no, I don't dare look back. Don't mention it. Don't bring it up again. <laughs> Still a little pain in there. Yeah, a little stab in the back here once in a while. But it, it, it was a, it was fine. You gonna quit? Mm, no. I mean, not really. I don't know how I can quit. What am I gonna do?